Welcome to Sterile Processing, Assembly, and Packing. We're looking at Chapter 12. This is going to be Part 1 of five lectures. Part 1 of five of the lecture. <clears throat> so in Assembly and Packing, this is the area of the department where trays are assembled and racked. They're containerized or peel packed for sterilization. So we're doing this before uh, sterilization because after sterilization, Everything that's been sterilized has to have a barrier of some sort keeping microorganisms out. So the area of the department where we do this is known as prep and pack. Uh, things need to be able to be transported safely without becoming contaminated or more likely even uh, stored for future use. So in the prep and pack area, this is our last opportunity to make sure that things are um, safe for the patient. So we have to inspect them, make sure that they function correctly. We also need to make sure that they're clean. This is very important. If you should find something during the setup process that doesn't function or isn't clean, you cannot put it into the set or any kind of uh, barrier packaging and sterilize it. What you're gonna have to do is if it's not cleaned, send it back to the decontamination room. Don't attempt to clean it on the clean side in the prep and pack area. If it's not functioning, you can send it out for repair and uh, get it back up from the backup instruments. In the prep and pack area, the physical environment needs to be maintained between 73, I'm sorry, actually bottom 68 degrees and 73 degrees, and with a relative humidity of 30 to 60 percent. And this is uh, optimum not only for the employees that are working in this area, but also for the packaging. The packaging materials need to be kept at a certain uh, temperature and humidity range. This is important because if, they're, if they fall out of that range, they're not going to work very well as packaging. And air pressures in this area need to be maintained um, at at least 10 changes per hour of positive pressure. So that means that air is being pushed into the room through filters and if the door should open to the department, that filtered air is moving out into the hallway instead of having the dirty air. Yes, it's dirty even though it's okay to breathe it out there. We want to keep contaminants like lint and dust. We want to keep them out of our department. So that air outside, that's dirty air. And we call this 10 positive air changes. So the clean side, the prep and pack area, and where the sterilization takes place, this is positive air that is filtered. Um, so this should be clean of all contaminants, as clean as possible. Yeah, it's pretty much impossible to eliminate everything. And so for that reason, we have to make sure that we're also doing housekeeping because dust and lint does happen. So housekeeping means that we keep our area clean. Actually, as clean as the operating room. Just think about how clean an operating room must be. If you don't know, then let me tell you, it has to be spick and span. No dust, no lint particles, no foreign materials of any kind. 100% as clean as possible. Um, so it's not a sterile area that we work in, but it is a clean area. So the housekeeping standards need to be high. Um, additionally, we need to have our own personal hygiene standards set high. What you do at home is fine. You can wear the same shirt two days in a row and it's not gonna harm a patient. What we do in the hospital is every day we have to wear clean hospital provided scrubs that have been laundered and uh, have never been outside since they've been laundered. They should only be worn in the department and not out to the parking lot because you have to go and get your cell phone or whatever. We need to maintain this high standard. Um, washing our hands, I want to say obsessively. You're going to wash your hands a lot more when you're working in the sterile processing prep and pack area than you probably have in your life. At least that's what I hope. Okay, where was I? Hand hygiene, dress code and personal behaviors. Okay, so as I mentioned, your scrubs need to be clean and your hands need to be cleaned. Um, additionally, you are not going to want to wear, I'm sorry, it just bothers you. 
nail polish or artificial nails or jewelry. If you're wearing hand jewelry, it's, um, it might not be cleanable. Now, this particular ring is cleanable. I can take it off and I can clean it and put it back on. A lot of people get away with this. Um, it's not, you're not really endangering the patient as long as you're keeping everything clean. But those big chunky diamonds, a couple things. You probably don't want to risk losing the diamond while you're working. Um, a doctor finds it in a set and he's like, hey, what's this? But we also have an unsterile set. Anything that's not approved to be into that set and approved to go through that sterilization process is, uh, means that you have an unsterile set. So if your artificial nail should fall off into the set, um, you are going to get written up, I hope. So, so don't wear artificial nails in sterile processing. Imagine, imagine this. You're just going on about your business. And you're like, oh, my nail's gone. And then the manager walks up to you the next day and she's like, uh, hey, uh, guess what they found in your set? <laughs> oh, and she's probably not gonna be laughing. Okay. <clears throat> and <laughs> imagine, the OR getting something that they can't use or that has blood on it. I mean, just imagine any of these scenarios. This is our responsibility to make sure that everything is good to go. Um, so I'm looking at page 245 right now in the book. Look at this gentleman. He's wearing a uh, hospital under scrubs and he's wearing a hair covering that covers his ears. This is the best practice. Although you may see many people not wearing it covering their ears because honestly it is kind of uncomfortable and takes a little bit of time getting used to. Um, he is covering his ears, but are his hands clean? I don't know. I can't look at something and see if it's clean unless it's like obviously, I mean, if he's got peanut butter and jelly on his fingers, I'm gonna say they're probably not clean. But if he's doing right by the patient, he's been keeping his hands clean. So the hair covering is a requirement of the ANSI Amy ST79, which states that all head and facial hair, except for eyebrows and eyelashes, should be completely covered with a surgical type hair covering. Um, jewelry and wristwatches should not be worn in the area because they can harbor microorganisms. So look again at the gentleman in the picture. If he had this going on, he'd be wearing a beard cover. Moving on. So. Can you bring your cell phone or some kind of device to perhaps play music or some other device into the department from outside? You'll need to consult with your facility's policy on that. Uh, however, if your facility's policy does allow it, it is likely to state that such items must be disinfected um, as before they enter the, the department. Look behind me at this department. Can you see dust? I don't. You know what I don't see? I don't see, basically, I don't see anybody working. It looks like a brand new department. I have a look. It's beautiful. It, um, it's, it's immaculate. Okay, I'm back. Um, but we can't really see all the dangers. We can't see microorganisms, etc. So this did not get this way by accident. It is kept clean. It has been, I'm sure, religiously disinfected all the surfaces and so on. However, that won't eliminate all the dust and lead. It has to be done routinely. And then, so talking about primary goals of pack preparation on page 246. <clears throat> So the first goal is to create a pack that meets the user's needs. And the acronym FAN, F-A-N, which stands for functional, accurate, and neat, can help to reinforce that goal. So function, everything in the pack has to function properly, which means that you have to test it. If it's a scissors, there's a way to test it to see if it's capable of cutting. If it's something like a forceps, you need to bring the tips together, Make sure the tips meet. Make sure there's no little broken teeth off the forceps. That's a real life uh, issue that can happen. Accurate. Okay, so you're a brain surgeon. 
right? And you know exactly the instruments you need. They're your tools. You use these every time you do the surgery. And they've substituted, those people who set up the instrument sets, they've substituted one instrument for another instrument that looks similar. But that doesn't mean it's gonna function the same. <clears throat> so it has to be the correct instrument in the pack. Sometimes there are substitutions allowed, but we don't decide which substitutions are allowed. That is the user who decides that, excuse me. And meat, imagine you're a, uh, a surgical tech working in the trauma room and you open up a trauma tray and it doesn't look like, uh, <laughs> it doesn't look like the other trays. Where is the, where is anything? It is, it is, it's a scrambled mess. So we need to make sure everything's neat. Actually, a lot of facilities, and I'm, I'm in agreement with this, state that each tray every time should be set up to be a copy of every other tray. So every time a craniotomy set is set up, it's a copy of all of the other craniotomies that were set up. Especially something like a craniotomy or a emergency heart tray. Um, the instruments need to be easily findable to, to the people who need them. So functional, accurate, and neat. Now, how do we know what goes into a set? There's something called a count sheet or a recipe. Yeah, we used to call them recipes. Um, a count sheet is basically, it's a, it could be printed out paper or it could be electronic on a computer screen that you're looking at. And then you just take your little mouse and you click, click, click that you're adding the items to the, um, to the tray or you take your pen on paper and you go, I'm writing two because that's how many the count sheet calls for. And uh, the count sheet should also have other information on it, like the complete and correct name of the tray, a detailed list of what goes into the tray, especially including quantities, the sizes, and the catalog or reference numbers. This is a blessing for you. The reference numbers, you may not know what an item is because you've never done this particular setup on this particular tray before, but if it has a reference number, uh, it'll help you to find the item. If it's, it's assuming that it's not already in the tray because for the most part, we're just resetting trays that have already been set up. They want to get used, they come back to the decontamination room, they get cleaned, they get sent through the washer, and then we reset them. We just unscramble them to put them back the way they were. But sometimes items do go missing. So reference number is gonna be your best friend, let me tell you. You have other best friends too, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, there may be essential steps for preparation and inspection. Uh, there may be um, specific instructions for correct placement of items in the tray. So for example, maybe it'll say, these things go on the stringer in this order starting with something like the back house and the mosquitoes and then the Kellys and so on and so forth, ending perhaps with the needle holders. If that's the order they're listed on the count sheet, then that's the order they want them in. And then other specific instructions for placement in the tray, like the forceps go into a pouch and then they go laying in the bottom of the tray. Things to keep in mind, you need to make sure that when you're assembling the set that you do follow the count sheet or the recipe to the letter and if anything should be missing, that you get approval before you put that instrument set up sterile um, because it may be something that is vital to that tray. Sometimes the OR will approve that it can go up missing something, but that has to be clearly marked on the outside of the tray so that when they go and take the tray to be used, they'll know what it's missing. And they can say, well, oh, Dr. Jones, he needs this instrument, so I can't use this tray. Or um, Dr. Smith, she doesn't need this instrument for this case, so I can use this tray. Okay. Um, all items to be sterilized must be completely dried prior to assembly and packaging because water left on instruments can interfere with the sterilization cycle. Water left and going into a steam cycle can throw off the wet-dry ratio. It'll change it, and that can end with sterilization failure. Water going into an ethylene oxide cycle can actually, uh, because ethylene oxide is a poisonous, toxic gas, it can combine with the water and create a poisonous, toxic liquid. So you still have a poison in the set. 
Um, but with hydrogen peroxide and ozone cycles, the machine will not be able to perform the sterilization and it will just abort the cycle. Then you have to take everything out of the machine, repackage everything, make sure it's dry this time, put it back into the machine and rerun it. And that could, uh, well, it's just a waste of time for one, but it could set back uh, scheduled surgeries if they're waiting for something that was in the sterilizer and then suddenly it's not sterile because there was water in there. <clears throat> okay, so there may be exceptions sometimes to the moisture in the steam cycles, which are the autoclave cycles, um, but that's gonna be determined by the manufacturer. If uh, the manufacturer states that a lumen should be moistened before sterilization, the logic behind that is that the water, the moisture that you're squirting into the lumen with a syringe, is going to become steam. It's going to actually become sterile inside of the lumen. So lumens are unique in that because it may be difficult for the, the machine generated steam to get into that lumen. So that steam that's created in the lumen by the moisture uh, can help to become sterile. However, this is only to be done if the manu manufacturer of the item says to do so. Been through the pages. Scissors sharpness testing. Okay, as I stated earlier, instruments need to be functioning before they can go into the sterilizer. So, scissors sharpness testing um, and all other instruments testing are performed with devices or materials that we have, uh, that we must have in our department. That will be a topic of part two of the lecture.